bitters burn It's deep in my soul, soul He's lived here for years, years He just won't let go He's laying around He's got a mean bite Now he's ready to fight Welcome back into The Door Report, episode 264 on a cold, colder than last week, but still lovely Tuesday evening, March 19th, 2024. I am Will Byram, joined as always by my co-host, Trevor Hewlin, and this week, actually joined by our producer, Phoebe the producer. Phoebe, thank you for fixing the audio. Do you have anything you want to say to the listeners? A few sniffs, a few nose twitches. <laughs> not a coherent thought behind those eyes, Doesn't baby. Doesn't need them. Not a lot of coherent thoughts on this whole side of the table, it's to be okay. honest. I still love you, Phoebe. But here at The Door Report, we are presented by 615 Collectibles. If you're into sports cards or sports memorabilia, check out 615 Collectibles on eBay. Just search 615 Collectibles. And shipping is always fast and free. Website coming soon, 615collectibles.com, coming summer 2024. Trevor, I don't want to say beefy, but we have quite a bit of news to go over. A lot of things have happened over the last week. We're giving a quick praise to the man upstairs right now because the biggest news of the week, Jerry Stackhouse has been let go as head coach of Vanderbilt basketball again baby it's over (laughs) our long nightmare (laughs) is over the other half is broken (laughs) trevor i'm not even getting through the full intro here and it's already broken (laughs) thank god we're on the bottom floor or that would have been a nightmare for our downstairs neighbors if we were on the second or third floor what even the hell was i gonna talk so I, bef- we also have Vanderbilt baseball oh. to get into. <laughs> Vandy women's basketball is going dancing and also a little bit of football to get into. But Trevor, on the note of Jerry Stackhouse, as you just destroyed the remainder of that bobblehead that was already headless, Jerry Stackhouse's head, I think, may just remain on this table for a while as heads have rolled. <laughs> heads? Baby. Oh, bars. Heads have rolled. That's podcasting, baby. You may think we're a little harsh. There's criticism. Of course, a man lost his job. That man was compensated very well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Better than our wildest imaginations. We will never see that money, that type of money ever in Just our an annual compensation. It's crazy number. We're not even discussing the buyout. Not even talking about the 15 plus million dollar buyout that was paid. So we're not celebrating over some financial advisor no. being fired from McGugan. This is celebrating a man that made millions of dollars as uh, the head coach of Vanderbilt basketball. And... Just in a buyout alone. Tens of millions Just of in a dollars. buyout alone. A reported 26 mil. Jesus Christ. This man, he really... <laughs> so was, oh, a man lost his job. I do get that to an extent. If that is your narrative, you can shove it. This dude got 26 mil like to get... He got fired and was rewarded 26 mil. Shout out to whoever his legal team is. Um, hey, whoever his agent is. Please contact us. We would love to have We him. We're... Blake Froming might be on the chopping block if Jerry Stackhouse's <laughs> financial well, or attorney uh, bangs our line. We're still going to need probably an agent, if I had to be honest. Ooh. Probably he probably it probably was an agent with him it, being a you're former probably player, right? Yeah. So we may still retain old Blake Froming yeah, as our we'll legal take a counsel. Timeout on on, on firing you know, Blake. All these contracts were being offered at here at TDR. We might need an agent to negotiate them. <laughs> yeah, Big dude. bucks rolling in. Yeah. But you initially had the idea. And then we'll actually get into this episode to bury the Jerry Stackhouse bobblehead. He can still get buried in a shoebox outside of our apartment. I was thinking through the logistics of that. 
we don't have a yard. We have kind of an outdoor area outside of the patio in our apartment. We also, big piece missing from this puzzle, we don't have a shovel. I was really thinking about that today. I was like, oh, we can do that today you, before the episode. That's a great point. We I, do not own a shovel. I also don't want to go buy a shovel. We can just buy a cheap $10 shovel. That's true. Because we're not burying them six feet. Maybe like what? Like a couple inches under the ground. <laughs> just right outside of our patio. The next people, <laughs> it just washes up and they find a Jerry Stackhouse bobblehead just float up after a big rainstorm. <laughs> the freaking skunk that just patrols our apartment brings it like just do they dig? I'm sure they dig. He digs he it up. He digs into the garbage bags that we sit out for the trash service. <laughs> Will to pick and I up. have a feral skunk outside of our door, and he scares the hell out of us. I'm afraid to come into my apartment at night because I keep seeing this skunk at the door. I got a text from Trevor. I was out celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Got a got a text from Trevor that there was a skunk outside of our apartment. I laughed at the message. Then I got back late Saturday evening slash sunday morning and there was a skunk directly outside <laughs> yeah. of the apartment i was like oh shit <laughs> literally just munching on our neighbor's even, garbage even with the warning it was a bit shocking he's a big dude. boy dude it's a beefy i've skunk. never seen this i've only seen dead skunks on the side of the road that's the first one i've seen alive dude he, he's he's like the size of a small dog dude i was tiptoeing in I dude, was like i was scared dude i whenever i was leaving i opened the door and i like peeked my head out and i was like is he there? Dude, part of and me, I didn't see any movement, and so I slowly tiptoed to the stairs. Part of me, so how my last month or so has gone, part of me when I saw that skunk on my doorstep was like, it's going to spray me. <laughs> like, this is perfect. Just spray me down, skunk. Destroy my life. Bury it eight feet underground. Just go ahead and do it. But Trevor, let me recap a little bit. But what we have locked and loaded for episode 264, Vanderbilt baseball, like I mentioned, Vanderbilt women's basketball, Jerry Stackhouse being fired, the Vanderbilt men's basketball coaching search, and a very brief discussion about the opening of spring practice for Vanderbilt football. Before we get into all that and much more, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Door Report. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. And while you're at it, give our podcast five stars and a review on iTunes. It's now time for segment one. Welcome to the fucking show. Welcome back into segment one of episode 264. Me and Trevor had a little discussion after the break from the intro. I think we're going to open this up with the least amount of discussion we have on a topic and that's the beginning of spring practice for Vanderbilt football and that's because it literally just started today exactly there's not going to be much to say about it however there was some news recently uncovered I guess Vanderbilt football spring game not going to be open to the public being held at Innsworth Innsworth yeah first scrimmage at Lipscomb closed to the public Second scrimmage at Endsworth, close to the public. Technically, the quote-unquote spring game, Endsworth, close to the public. And that was going to be on April 20th. Yeah. So not open to the public, so it doesn't really matter what yeah. day it's on. Assuming it's not going to be streamed on SEC Network or anything like that. Yeah, no cameras. They want to keep everything off tape. Which I understand. Uh, we had this discussion earlier. I don't want to get too deep into it. In my opinion, I've never understood why spring games exist in the first place is open to public. It would be very odd. I guess you could say it's kind of like preseason in the NFL. Mm -hmm. But what benefit does it bring to a football team to have a public te and televised spring game? That's a fair point. That's a fair point. It can only result in people picking up on your new scheme, especially when you have new coordinators yeah. and new players like Vanderbilt does and Nate Johnson and Tim Beck. So I'm, you know, I wasn't going to be able to attend anyway because of prior uh, tickets that I have to a Shane Gillis show with the Ryman. But where'd you get that cheese, Danny? <laughs> 
the classic. I made Trevor watch a Shane Gillis special. He's my favorite now, comedian. Now he's now. a fan. He's my. F- I've, I've been listening to Matt and Shane's Secret Podcast, dude. dude. It's so funny. You cannot. If you actually listen to Matt and Shane's Secret Podcast, you can't dislike it. I don't it's care really where. Really good. I don't care where you land on the political scale. What your opinions are, it you'll it's find really yourself funny. crying laughing at some point. So <laughs> they don't care. They don't need more listeners. But listen, if you have the chance. <laughs> Anything else you want to add about what we've seen, at least early, uh, from Vanderbilt football? Well, we haven't really seen anything. Nothing. Uh, Nate Johnson uh, at practice was wearing a number 17 quarterback jersey. That is not going to be his number per Nate Johnson's Twitter account. I think in all of the recruiting uh, photos he took, he was number three. So I tell you what, man, he's going to look fast in that number three. He's going to have to battle with Quincy. Wait. Oh. Quincy will give it up. You think? I think I think he would look great as, as with the number four. Um, uh, that's Nate Johnson. I think Nate Johnson is built for wearing the number four. I think that could be the move. I think that's a, a Pat, great number. Pat and Robinette. That's General, what I'm doing. I think he would look awesome in number four. So, Nate Johnson, consider it. You're not listening, but consider wearing number four. Even number six. I know that's Cutler, but Austin Carter Samuels wore it. I think he would look great as a number six. Any single-digit number. To be honest, at the quarterback position is going to. Nate Johnson looked pretty damn good in number 17. He me. did. He I'm did look honest. good. He, so, he looked great in 17. The only reference I really have for that is Stephen, Stephen Rivers. Rivers. Yeah. So you can't wear 17. No, you, he it's can't. a bad number. Um, That's about it for football. <laughs> we don't have anything else. We don't know anything else. Spring practice just opened and we can't go to the spring game. You can't hear the pads pop. We, so. can, we can say, and this isn't a, a major note, but per Robbie Weinstein, um, Grayson Morgan, who was about like I think 280 pounds whenever he played last year, is 300 plus now. Um, so looking to lock down that center position. Uh, shout out to Steiner, dude. <laughs> That's a lot of weight. That's some good weight. Grayson Morgan needed to put on that weight badly, 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 badly. The O line, I will add to this, and then we'll move to baseball real quick, and then get to what people actually want to hear about, which is Jerry Stackhouse and the current going on coaching search there was an issue with the o-line being big in numbers last year yeah in weight and height but not looking very agile yeah they were a top five heaviest offensive line in and college it, football last so year. so i don't put too much weight in that he obviously grace morgan obviously needed to put on weight so that's yeah. a good thing individually for him however the focus cannot be just getting the heaviest guys in there i know that's no. obvious i'm not breaking it any you, you can't have another xavier castillo and almost 400 pounds yeah. he can't get out of his stance exactly especially in this offense that they're going to be running uh which i'm assuming is going to be pretty similar to what we saw from new mexico state last year i tell you what what if we're just and this is the last thing i'll say before we get to baseball what if we have like an early 2010 like Oregon style offense to our offensive drives just last like 40 seconds and it's just point after point after point I just want to see good offense, dude. No, honestly, <laughs> you're, you're, yeah. It's been a while. It's been a long since time. Since we've seen a very... When was when I was time? about to ask. Dude, because here, hot take. Those 20. Andy Ludwig offenses were not really that good. Like, I remember being pissed off and being like, dang, these Andy Ludwig offenses suck until they went to play Tennessee and every year Andy Ludwig was like, I'm going to show that I should win the Broyles. I mean, on 2018 one game. was a fun offense with explosive guys. I would say that's the last time we saw a pretty good Vanderbilt. That offense. was a um. That was the Baylor bowl game. I, I mean, say. I mean, if you want to be honest, the best Vanderbilt offense we've ever seen is the 2012 Vanderbilt offense. Well, Jordan yes. Rogers, Boyd, Matthews, Zach Stacy. Little probably should cut his name. Um. I mean, gosh, dude, what's what a, what a great bunch of guys. Yeah, there have not been a not ton Zach of Zach Stacy, though. To be honest, there just haven't been a ton of good offenses in all of Vanderbilt football history. So it would be nice. To That's see a great this point. Year. Yeah. Let's move on to baseball here. The Vandy boys may never lose again. Some are saying. Some are saying. Some are saying. Vanderbilt baseball, since we last recorded, beat Indiana in a midweek game 13 to 5, and then went on to sweep Auburn in their first SEC series. Number 18 of the Auburn. Season. Winning eleven to one in game one, thirteen to five in game two, nine to six in game three, moving Vanderbilt baseball to seventeen and three on the season. Vanderbilt's currently playing Belmont right now at First Tennessee Park. Uh, I I believe so. However, it's or is it called First Horizon? 
I think it's First Horizon. I don't know. I'm screwing it up. But all I know is I tried to watch that game instead of watching the one of the first four games uh, yeah. of the NCAA tournament, and the ESPN app was not working. Yeah, you just can't watch it. So I've been unable uh, to keep up with that one. But last time that we had a score update, Vanderbilt was in a tight battle with Belmont, leading 3-1. to one. Yeah, I'm trying to find an update on my watch right now, and I don't have one. Um, so I'm going to assume at... 8 56 Tuesday night, they're still up 3 1. Let's hope. I, to be completely honest, I watched the Indiana game midweek. I only caught a little bit of the Auburn series on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Set a friend's birthday on Friday, celebrated St. Patrick's Day all day on Saturday, and I was recovering on Sunday. So it was quite an adventurous weekend for me. Did not, was not able to catch a bunch of of Vanderbilt baseball. I know you watched Trevor. Any yep. thoughts on what you saw? I mean, the hitting continues to look sensational. The pitching continues to look sensational. My big takeaway is that uh, Cozeal, maybe the injury was not as serious as we thought. Um, and so that's a huge positive. Um, it does suck losing Maldo, but I'm very hopeful. And I, I think this is going to be the case that this offense uh, can still move forward. Um, I'm very excited about that. One guy I would like to highlight specifically, um, whenever I first saw him playing first base, I thought RJ Austin at first base was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen in my life. He's really holding his own there defensively, and I just want to give him a shout-out. Smaller guy, his body type really not built to play first base. He's doing a really, really good job, and it's funny because you see, you look at him, you're like, okay, he can play first base. He can play anywhere in the infield that's not catcher. He, I mean, he can play center field too. I'm, I, I, he can play the corners. He literally is. He's, he's like the prototypical utility player, and he's, he's done really, really well there defensively. So I just wanted to shout him out. Yeah, Trevor, you've got a lot, a lot of work cut out for you. It's well known I'm not the baseball guy. I love here. baseball. So the, the more we move into SEC baseball play the more I'm just going to be swinging it to you. Yeah, and this was a big series because obviously it's the opening to SEC play. Auburn comes in a really good Auburn team, ranked 18 in the nation, and Vanderbilt just sort of let their nuts drag all over them. Uh, Auburn really never had a chance. I know the Sunday game, Vanderbilt was trailing early, uh, but once again, the Cardiac Commodores come back, show that they're the better team. The bats get to work, and bullpen did a great job. Uh, I really, really like what I'm seeing from this ball club right now. And also after the sweep of Auburn, Got some national recognition. Vanderbilt yep. fans were like, this is a top five team. Absolutely. They need to move into the top five. And Vanderbilt moved to number three after sweeping Auburn. So raising some eyebrows across the country as to what this Tim Corbin squad can accomplish. Don't don't fact check me. That was D1 baseball. I believe for Baseball America, Vanderbilt's number two in the nation. Okay, I just saw D1 baseball. I believe Baseball America has them at two if I'm... I, th I think that's right. Regardless, this is obviously a top five team. And really, it's tough to say they're exceeding expectations because every year you go into a Vanderbilt baseball season and you say, hey, they're going to be really good. But there were some real question marks around this team. And so far, they are proving to be a really, really, really good ball club. Yep. You were right. Baseball America has Vanderbilt at number two. So you were correct. I did fact check you. Hey, and you were correct. Moving on from baseball, unless you have anything else you want to add on. Um, shout out to Tim Corbin for his 900th win at oh, Vanderbilt yeah. as a Vanderbilt Commodore. Um, collected 1,000 all time and collected 900 as a Commodore, so 100 away from another stack. So uh, shout out to, uh, to Big Timmy C. We were also discussing this earlier. And then, uh, just a brief discussion before we get to basketball. When Tim Corbin retires, they have to name something after Tim Corbin. Has to be something. Has to be. I would be okay with, and I know you can't change the Hawks' name, but I don't think this is a take that people are going to get upset with. I think you have to call it Corbin Field. It has to stay Hawkins Field. I I know, but dude, if they did change it, if they're like, hey, we talked to the Hawkins family, they agreed, I don't think fans would be upset. I think Tim Corbin would be upset. I think Tim Corbin would be like, no, don't you change that stadium. I think that's actually, I think he, I think he would be like, do not change that. Name. Maybe maybe Tim Corbin can get a street named after him. We should Cor change Corbin Magoog Wayne. into Corbin. Something as something. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to think about him retiring. No. He's going to be Vanderbilt's baseball coach for eternity. So I, why are we even talking about that's this? That's a great point. Maybe we should build him a statue while he's still coach. Ooh. A that statue would look great. That would hawk. look great outside the hawk. 
I like that idea. We'll get to brainstorming. I know the Vanderbilt Athletics Department really cares about me and Trevor's thoughts and opinions and ideas. Do you think they listen to the pod? There has to be somebody. I think a couple of them listen and report. Somebody is listening to it. There has to be at least one. We've got some sleeper agents in the TDR community, I think. I'm starting to think some of these burners that really like to interact with us, I think some of them are Magoog and sleeper agents. I think Coach Clint, I shouldn't, he's not a sleeper agent. I love Coach Clint. Part of me is like, is he a Magoog and sleeper agent? Mm. Really makes you wonder. Mm. Really makes you think. These are the big brain ideas that we have to think about all the time. Whenever mm. you guys are like, what do they talk about when they're not potting? We discuss who is the Magoog and sleeper agent within the Vanderbilt Twitter community. <laughs> That's about it. Yep. <laughs> that and maximizing shareholder value. That's what I talk about. And we just talk about locking in. Just absolutely locking in, dialing in. That's enough baseball talk. Let's talk a little basketball. First, got to give a shout out to the Lady Doors, a term that we have coined here at TDR. (laughs) I think the Lady Doors Vanderbilt women's basketball is dancing. Shea Ralph has the girls dancing. The ladies, the women, whatever the respectful term is. Uh, Vanderbilt women's basketball is in the play-in games of the NCAA tournament. Which is a shame. It is a shame. With Texas A&M getting a normal berth yep. in the tournament, obviously I don't have that much care and investment in it the same way, but it still did anger me a little bit Yeah, that Vanderbilt's in a playing game. This is clearly biased towards a program that has not had much recent success Yeah, versus just judging our success this season and way too much weight being placed on the NCAA net. I agree. I, I think there was too much weight placed on it in men's basketball and women's basketball. I don't think that's a controversial statement. The net is broken. It's a dumb setup that never should have been implemented. You know what, dude? Sometimes to move forward, you have to go back. Bring back the RPI. Bring it back. I don't know if there's a single metric that's going to encapsulate college basketball perfectly. I think Ken Palm should actually be utilized. I don't know why it's not. I don't know what the hesitation is to utilize the best analytics site that perfectly, as perfectly as is possible, ranks teams. Undeniably, nobody questions that. And they don't use it. Instead, they use a made-up NCAA net with some arbitrary rules based on win margin. I think we just gave the nerds too much power. I think think analytics has gone too far. We did it in baseball. That was the big problem. (laughs) Moneyball ruined baseball. We we romanticized Moneyball, but man. The A's never won. That is true. Billy Bean left to go win a title with the Sox. Analytics only gets you so far. That's enough women's basketball. I'm already bored of talking about it. (laughs) That'll um, people. That will. I don't care. <laughs> I I truly like. I don't mean this is like. I respect it. I don't care. Um, moving on to the actual news of this podcast. Do you want to take a cocktail break before we dig into this beefy part? That's a Let's great way it, to take a cocktail break after I shit on women's sports. Uh, so grab yourself a cold one, and we will be right back to discuss the Jerry Stackhouse firing and potential coaching candidates for Vanderbilt men's basketball. Welcome back from the TDR cocktail break. Trevor, we have the much anticipated discussion and celebration slash celebration. Jerry Stackhouse has been fired after his fifth season as the Vanderbilt men's basketball head coach. I used to pray for times like this to rhyme like this. Shine like this. To shine like this. Vanderbilt in year five of Jerry Stackhouse's tenure finished the season nine and twenty-three, capping it off with a first round loss in the SEC tournament to Arkansas, ninety to eighty-five in overtime. In much fitting fashion, Vanderbilt was up fourteen points at halftime over the Arkansas Razorbacks, up forty-one to twenty-seven and blew that lead throughout the second half in a piss-poor display of basketball until our sweet savior, Ezra Mignon, 
hit another incredible buzzer beater to send the game to overtime. We Bef- love you, Ez. Before we get into all this other stuff, because I'm going to forget it, I want to fully just take a moment and give a huge shout-out to Ezra Mignon. Yep. None of these negative comments we have had all season have anything to do with Ezra Mignon. Absolutely. He, since he stepped foot on campus, Ezra Mignon has been nothing but an incredible player uh-huh. that has improved his game from week to week, yep. not even season to season, game to game. He just seems to keep getting better. A guy that came in and couldn't shoot, and now he's a better shooter than Tyron Lawrence, shooting over 31% from three last season. Mm-hmm. The guy that kept Vanderbilt competitive in a lot of these games, along with Van Allen Lubin. Yep. Shout out to Ezra Mignon. Yeah, nothing but respect for Ez. Um, it truly is a shame how your career ended, um, but I – I feel very confident in saying that Ezra Mignon will go down as one of the most beloved Commodores in basketball history. Just seems to be a good guy. Yeah, I don't know just him. Seems like a nice guy, hardworking too, guy, incredibly talented. We'll see if his career progresses any further. A little bit undersized as a point guard, not a great shooter. Probably not going to be an NBA guy, but potentially somebody that could play in the G League or could play overseas. Be very interested to see how that plays out because he gave 100% effort on a really, really, really shitty basketball team. Absolutely. It is very easy to mail it in on defense or even on just offensive possessions when you are the 100% sure starting point guard on a bad basketball team. Yep. And Ezra Mignon did not mail in a single performance his entire career. A guy, I think I tweeted this, a guy that just deserved better yep, during absolutely. his time at, time at West End. I wish it would have been more success yeah. to him. So just had to give that shout out. You know what? Put number five in the rafters. <laughs> I'll say it. I won't go that far. Put, but, number, put number five in the rafters. Not quite that far. But shout out to Ez. Jerry Sackhouse fired uh, in his final season, by the way. I might want to fact check me on this. I read this in an article. Vanderbilt finished 186th in the Ken Palm rankings, the lowest finish in program history post-internet, obviously. Yeah. So that's pretty incredible considering we had Bryce Drew go 0-18 in conference. And I didn't I didn't fact check it, so somebody out there can maybe fact check me. According to an article I read, Vanderbilt still finished higher in the Ken Palm after going 0-18 in the SEC, which is impressive. Hey, Jerry continued to break records. What can you hey. say? Moving in the not, right direction. Not, not, not good records. The streak, lowest in Ken Palm, just continues to break records. He almost had the worst record in the history of the program. He he, he almost did. Very he, close. He almost did the unthinkable. A nice win on senior night against Florida saved him from that. Yeah. So That's the reason I don't have Florida going far in my brackets, because I look at them and I go, a team that lost to Vanderbilt cannot go to the round of 32. So I... I have to hit on this before we get into the Vanderbilt men's basketball coaching candidates. Uh, The SEC basketball tournament's alcohol policy. (laughs) So I actually went to the first round game against Arkansas. Attended it. Met some friends there. Got there early. Left work about 30 minutes early. Told my boss. They were like, go ahead. Have a good time. So I got there early. Was like, I'm going to go find a beer. It's an SEC tournament in Bridgestone. Figured I could find a beer. I walked the entire an entire lap around the first floor of Bridgestone. No beer stands. Mm-hmm. It's like, what the heck? Am I this stupid? How am I not finding yeah, the beer? Yeah, where's the beer? Walked up to somebody that was working like a popcorn stand and was like, is there alcohol here? And they said, yes, but not on this floor. It's only served in a lounge on the third floor or on the club level. <laughs> so I went up to my friends who were getting some beverages on the club level, got a drink. We tried to go to our seats. You couldn't bring the beer into the seating area. So I had to watch part of the game on the Jumbotron standing next to an usher in one of the little hallways to the club level seating. Insane. Someone explained, I I missed something. Why? Yeah. What is the rule that is regulating that? It would make sense if alcohol was not able to be served like it used to be at college sporting events. Mm-hmm. But I can go to Memorial Gym and buy a beer and watch a game. I can go to Thompson Bowling in Knoxville, buy a beer, watch the game. Why can I not do that at the SEC tournament in Bridgestone? But it's not just that. 
you could buy alcohol. Yeah. That that's what blew my mind. If it was one thing, they just don't serve alcohol yeah. during the SEC tournament. Okay. It's a dumb rule, but at least it makes a little bit of sense. Yeah. There's a full bar open on the multiple beer stands like on the set, on the club bar. level. Yes. That you could buy alcohol at. What was the purpose of that? Were you afraid people were going to throw beer cans onto the court? I I can't even wrap my brain around that making sense. I believe they did that last year, too, because me and my father, my father doesn't drink, but I wanted a beer. So we were like roaming around. I'm like, Where in the hell can I get a beer here? I'm just fiending for a course light. And I could not find any. But that's about it, the end of that rant. It just pissed me off so much that I've wanted to rant about that just a little bit. Going into this, how I do want to say the attendance at the first at the play in games of the SEC tournament was crazy. Very impressive. There were so many people there. Mm -hmm. I used to go to those all the time in high school with buddies, and we would literally get there an hour before the game and sit like in the second row with yeah. nobody around us. I had to sit in the third level mm -hmm. for a majority of that game. Yeah. <laughs> after I wandered around in the club level and got a beer. So I know they sent out a deal. Where tickets were 75 cents. That may have been why there were so many people in attendance. Very possible. Don't do that again. Yeah. Please do not do that again. Okay. I know it was good for the environment. It might have been good for television optics, but I enjoy sitting at those shitty play in games slash the first round. It's yeah. not the first round of the SEC tournament, but the first round, I like going there and spreading out, pay 25 bucks, limit the crowd, get some concessions, enjoy myself. No. It yeah. was jam-packed full of idiots. So <laughs> the SEC tournament, get it together. Serve alcohol. Let us bring alcohol in the seats. And don't do the 75-cent deal. Next year, we're just going to have to bring flasks. <laughs> if I would have known, I might have. I mean, next year, we will have the knowledge of, hey, this is the alcohol policy. We'll just bring our own flasks. Well, maybe next year, I'll be a lot more invested in the actual SEC tournament and the product on the court. I think you might be. I'm really, I think you might be. I'm really hoping so, and one of these names I'm about to list off oh. might be the reason why. Trevor. Also, we need to give a shout-out to you. You were always on the, hey, guys, Jerry Stackhouse is going to get fired train. I was not. I, I was like, oh, my God, he's coming back. Oh, my God, the nightmare continues. Will, the whole time, despite the reports, was like, guys, he's going to get fired. So... Take your victory lap. A well-deserved victory lap. Yeah. You know, I'm not right 100% of the time, but occasionally I am, and I'm going to bask in it <laughs> because I never faltered from the fact that all of this was bullshit and sh her hand was going to be forced. If Candace Story Lee wasn't going to do it, then Daniel Deermeyer was going to step in and do it yeah. because this program was going to get to an irrecoverable level if they retained Jerry Stackhouse. It, it wasn't an option yeah. at this point. The national media would have started taking attention, taking what's the right term? Attention, Take, taking notice, taking notice. There we go. Taking notice of what was going on in the lack of care. And it would have been the end of Vanderbilt. We, we also too, we need to get on this. I tweeted this out and some people disagreed. I fully stand by this. This was a proud moment in Vanderbilt fan history because I believe this. I, I I do believe the report that Chris Lee and Robbie were both reported that Candace was going to bring him back. This is a big moment, and this is where we disagree. I think this is a big moment in Vanderbilt fan history to where the fans voiced their, uh, voiced their opinion so much that it finally forced the administration to do something. Because I do believe, when, like, whenever I saw those reports, I didn't believe Chris at first. And then as time progressed, I was like, oh, God, I he might be right. And then Robbie came out, and I was like, I can't believe this is happening. So in my opinion, this is a big deal because for the first time ever, Vanderbilt fans were so united and so loud that they forced the administration to make a move that I don't think they wanted to make. So I, shout I out to us. I don't disagree with that fully. I just think the reports from Chris Lee and Robbie were psyops. I think that they got fed faulty information to test out what the fan base reaction would be, what the media reaction would be to that situation. But I don't think that was ever a real thing they were actually considering. I think they were truly maybe like 70, 30, 70% going to fire him. Gave some faulty information through some sketchy sources it got posted, and the reaction was what it was. 
I think a lot more of it probably had to do with donors pushback, I former think the players donors pushback. Made a big deal, yeah, rightfully so. Rightfully so. You you can't retain a coach that has no momentum. The recruiting classes have been where they have been. You're not going to retain players. You're losing most of the talent that you had. You just you had no choice. I, I know the buyout was crazy, a fireable level buyout, in my opinion. I we're never going to know the true number, but fifteen to sixteen million dollars is insane. Oh, it was twenty six. You is that the actual? that's what? And I don't want to. Sorry, Robbie. I know you put this behind a paid board. Robbie reported it was twenty six. I believe it was either Robbie or Chris. I get them confused a lot because I spend a lot of time on both. Somebody within the Vandy Insiders reported that it was twenty six mil. If if that's a true number, which I find that almost unbelievable. That he had a twenty six million. Like truly, I find that unbelievable. I think Nate Oates right now is ten. All I know is if that is even close to true, or even if it's fifteen or sixteen million. Yeah, I agree. Clark Lee has secured his job for three more seasons. Yeah, because there is no way they are going to fire Clark Lee after paying that type of buyout to Jerry Stackhouse and having to bring in a new men's basketball coach. I agree. So, whenever. I hope it doesn't happen. I hope Clark Lee goes on to win games this season, win, wins games next season, and this isn't even a discussion. But when people are potentially, obviously this is all hypothetical, calling for Clark Lee's job, and you're like, why is Vanderbilt not doing anything? Remember this moment. Yeah. Because they they just can't. Okay, that's a huge amount of money, whether it's 15, 16 million, or it's 26 million. That impacts the budget. Yep. Absolutely. That impacts that impacts the projected future revenue and expenses of the Vanderbilt Athletics Department. So shout out to Jerry Stackhouse's agent. Holy <laughs> yeah, shit. Dude. I mean, get that bag, my man. Yeah. Well, uh, apparently you're not supposed to be celebrating over a guy being fired, but he was paid between fifteen to sixteen million dollars slash twenty six million dollars to be fired. So I wish that was my buyout yeah. at my job that's laying me off at the end of the year. Also, I I went to his Twitter after he'd been fired and he like changed his Twitter profile picture and I clicked on it and I thought it was a cutout of his head. It didn't it but it was just a regular photo of him and I thought to myself, is this the real Jerry Stackhouse? I thought it was like a joke. Does that not look like a cut a cardboard cutout whenever like you close it out? So like go back to his profile without opening it. That does that not look like a cardboard cutout you'd bring to like a game? Jerry, that's I'm gonna be honest with you, Jerry. That's that, a it's not a good picture. It's not a good photo. Yeah, you're a much better looking dude than that. I, I would yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to hype you up too much, Jerry. I think you already hype yourself up enough, but that's not a good profile. Bad picture. angle. You, Back the camera up. Yeah, a couple you can feet. do much better than that. I also like the quote that's hanging on my wall, the man in the arena <laughs> from Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes, actually, it's it's not the critic who counts. Okay. That's hanging up above my desk, actually. Hey, but, he doesn't listen to the critics. He doesn't. Well, maybe, maybe you should have. And yeah. listen to your critics now. That's not a good profile picture, Jerry. Maybe. But, Maybe you should have listened to Judas. Mm. Mm. Once again, once again, Judas has won. <laughs> are, is 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 Judas? Are there two Judas? Are is Judas in the room with us right now? I think is Judas in the room. Where did Phoebe go? The call is coming from that, inside the house. Phoebe Where might, did Phoebe go? Phoebe might be Judas. But what if Phoebe is like a sentient being? Actually, <laughs> there's no way <laughs> she peed on my jacket. There's no way. But Jerry Stackhouse, Judas has won again. But <laughs> <laughs> let's get into the coaching candidates. We're now. still living, yeah. baby. <laughs> let's get to the coaching candidates here. I know you have an actual list. I you, think we I have my personal list, yes. I think me and you both have the same guy at the top of that list. We'll see. Okay. But I'm going to read through some candidates. Tell me if I missed anybody on this list. It's not in any particular order. I just jotted down some guys. And we'll run through each of these guys briefly if you want to. We can go into them as much detail as you would like. Uh, Chris Mack, Kyle Smith, Nico Medved. I'm going to mispronounce that. Jerome Tang, Bucky McMillan, Pat Kelsey, Amir Abdurrahim, Josh Schertz, Dusty May. Uh, Kyle Smith. Kyle Smith. Did I? Yeah, I said him. Here's oh, the second you? one. Sorry, I said. sorry, yeah. I didn't hear that. Anybody else you have outside of that list? We'll see. To be fair, Trevor does not have a laptop in front of him like I do. No, I'm just just 
straight brain power here. So I'm just going to go with the first candidate I read off first off Mm -hmm. on my tier list. There's tier one. That's Chris Mack. Yep, I'm right there with you. In my personal opinion, I'm going to defend why in a second. But Chris Mack is in a complete tier of his own when, when it comes to the head coaching vacancy. Formerly at Xavier and Louisville is the all-time winningest head coach in the history of Xavier basketball, was fired from Louisville after a 63-36 and record due to some absolutely BS allegations and a situation that would normally not get a head coach fired. Yeah. But because of the situation Louisville was in with a current investigation going on due to Rick Pitino's actions, they just didn't need more media fire raining down upon them, even for minor yeah. allegations that may have resulted from the Chris Mack situation. And can you tell the people that don't know at home what actually like he was doing that was illegal? So it's the silliest thing in the world. There is there are scandals and different things, and there's different scales of this stuff. So I don't have the full story. Obviously, I wasn't breaking the news on all this, but reading up on it more recently, basically, Chris Mack was fired due to a recorded conversation with a former assistant head coach where the assistant head coach alleged some very minor recruiting violations and things such as graduate assistants practicing with the team Mm -hmm. and things like that. And the actual firing occurred because Chris Mack recorded the conversation and did not report it to Louisville's administration immediately and in the correct pathways. So it wasn't necessarily the actual violations or allegations. It was how he went about reporting it and the transparency of reporting these allegations. I actually have the full transcript of the conversation that resulted in him being fired. If you would like me to read it, go for it. So I don't think a lot of people know about this. Yeah. It's you, all you hear is about the controversy with Chris Mack and, and he is a big personality. Yeah. Some issues. There was the big Xavier fight. There was a big brawl. I'm not saying he's a flawless coach with no character flaws. He has a big personality. That's what Vanderbilt needs right now. Vanderbilt needs somebody that's pissing, but the actual violations and you just read, he was let go due to recruiting violations at Louisville. He was not given a show cause. There wasn't anything like that at all. Some of his assistants were, but an assistant named Dino Gaudio, mm-hmm. I think that's how you I pronounce so. it. Uh, basically, he was going to fire him after the season after Louisville was left out of the NCAA tournament in his final, well, close to his final season. There is last full season. Dino Gaudio, in quote from the recording, you're not renewing my contract and you're paying me for a year and a half. All right. You're paying me for a year and a half. Here's why. Last time this happened to me, the last time this happened to me, I took the high road. I took the high road. I didn't say anything. Said all the good things. That shit affected my family, my career, my livelihood. That ain't happening again. That ain't happening again. See, let me show you something. You're going to think long and hard about this one, dude. You're going to be thinking long and hard about this one. See, it says in my contract here, if there's anything about NCAA violations, I'm supposed to talk to John Carnes, the Louisville compliance director. I'm supposed to talk to the athletic director. I'm supposed to talk to all those guys. And you know what? I fucking will. I fucking will. These GAs all practicing with us, illegal, illegal. I've got documentation from when she called me in the summer when we were emailing each other and texting each other. I'm talking about women's basketball coach Jeff Waltz. When Christine and whatever her name was came in here and said, those guys working guys out in the summer, they can't do that. That's illegal. All that shit, those 30 for 30s recruiting videos, I have that. That shit's fucking illegal. That shit's fucking illegal. Then, in quote, Chris Mack, why didn't you say anything? (laughs) Dino, now you tell me you're not renewing my contract. Chris Mack then says, why didn't you say anything? Dino goes up. This is kind of long. I don't know if you want me to keep going. This might is this entertaining? I think I think this is really good. This is the direct transcript from the recording. Then Dino Gaudio goes on to say, I don't want to be here. So you know what you're doing? You're going to fucking pay me between me and you, dude. You can go tell Vince. Hey, Vince, I don't care what the fuck you tell him. Vince, Dino's my guy. I'm going to pay him for his year and a half. He can retire at 66. I'm going to take care of him. That's what we can do. And you know what? That's what we're doing. Going to do. Or else I'm going to f- going to fucking walk off. 
I'm going to fucking John Carnes. I'm going to fucking Tim Sullivan. I'm going to Jay Billis, Dick Vitale, Fran Fricilla, all those fucking guys. That's the way it's going to go to fucking go down. That's the way this is going to fucking go down. I fucking helped you get former Louisville player. You didn't know who fucking that player was until I came back and Pat Kelsey told me. I helped you with the freaking two players. Are you fucking shitting me? Chris Mack then said, I know Dino. <laughs> then Dino <laughs> went on to say, you're right. This is a hard conversation. You're right. And you know what? You better think about it. You better think long and hard about it. I don't want to fucking be here now. You said that to me. Chris Mack then says, I know. I know. Then Dino goes on to say, so here's what you're going to do. This stays right here between me and you for about mm, 24 hours. You go to tell that fucking toad over there, Vince Tyra, Dino's my guy. I got to take care of him. I want to pay him for a year, okay? Then none of this fucking happens. Got it? Chris Mack then says, Dino. Dino says, got it? Chris Mack says, yeah, I got it. Can we talk? Dino says, that's all I got to say. Chris Mack goes on to say, Dino, Dino, can we talk? Dino, his assistant coach, says, are you fucking shitting me? After all the shit I did for you, you're fucking shitting me. Chris Mack says, can we talk? I don't want to fuck up your livelihood, bro. Dino then says, take your mask off. I can't hear you. Chris Mack goes on to say, I'm sorry. I don't want to fuck your livelihood up, Dino. Dino says, you did, man. You are. Chris Mack then says, I'm not. Dino says, yeah, you are. Chris Mack says, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I don't want to do that to you, Dino. I don't. I love you, man. I know you don't believe me. I love you. This is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I'm not trying to fuck your livelihood up, dude. I'll take it out of my own personal money. Good guy, Chris Mack. Dino goes, whatever you got to do, whatever you got to do. Chris Mack goes, I feel I owe you that. I don't fucking like. I'm not excited about this. That's the gist of it. There's a lot more to it. I'm not going to read everything. There's but basically, a ton more. the assistant the gist coach of it, I wanted. I'm sorry for all the F-bombs and all, that was just all the, the cursing. Yeah. I just wanted to read directly from the transcript, and it would have been really difficult to edit all of that out. Yeah, because he did. that guy did cuss a lot. It goes on for a while, and basically Dino just keeps going into these very minor recruiting violations yeah and that chris mack is screwing him out of his social security like a college assistant head coach needs the social security money yeah that's crazy to me but that co recorded conversation that chris mack recorded mm -hmm. for his own safety in the situation and then was later uncovered wasn't properly reported that's what got chris mack fired yeah so there's all of the headlines that you'll see and everything about the controversy related to Chris Max firing at Louisville. Garbage. Yeah, it it wasn't. True. Other than that, Chris Mack is so by far, in my opinion, the best candidate head and shoulders above any of those other names on the list. I, I agree. I think he's a I think he's a great basketball coach. And like we said, he brings that sort of grit and very fiery mentality that Vanderbilt currently needs right now. And I like a lot of the other names that Vanderbilt uh, insiders have suggested. I like Pat Kelsey. I like Kyle Smith. I like Bucky McMillan. I like those guys a lot. If Vanderbilt hired one of them, I would not be upset. Yep. But with that being said, with the current state of the program and where the current roster construction is at right now, Vanderbilt, I hate to say it, I don't think Vanderbilt can afford to get an up-and-coming basketball coach. This program's not set up for an up-and-coming guy to take over. You need somebody that's been in the mud, been in the trenches, knows how to win basketball games, knows how to construct basketball rosters to take over this program, and I think that's Chris Mack. So I agree with you. He's my personal number one as well. And the main criticism, I don't mean for this to be a full Chris Mack propaganda machine, the major issue that people have had with Chris Mack is basically he's just taken over programs that have been previously successful. Um, like at Xavier, a majority of his success was at Xavier. He took over for Sean Miller, who left for the Arizona job. But at Xavier, immediately went to a Sweet 16 in year one, then made the tournament again, then went to another Sweet 16, then had a down year going 17 and 14. Vanderbilt fans would love a I 17 and 14 for a 17 season. And 14 season. Then after that, went to the went to the NCAA tournament again. Then went to the Sweet 16 again. Then made it to the round of 32. Then made it to the Elite Eight. Then made it to the round of 32. Then went to Louisville after leaving Xavier as the winningest head coach of all time. 
a new head coach took over in Tristan Steele, who ended up not going to a single NCAA tournament, being let go, and then Sean Miller coming back from Arizona, taking over Xavier, and going to an NCAA tournament immediately as a three seed. Mm -hmm. So maybe Sean Miller, who Chris Mack learned underneath as an assistant, maybe maybe Chris Mack and Sean Miller are just good head coaches. It's yeah, who maybe thought? maybe it's not just Xavier's a uh, perennial powerhouse for no reason. Maybe those two guys are good head coaches. Yeah, with proven track records, and it's not like he was fired from Louisville after horrendous seasons. First season at Louisville, he went to the NCAA tournament, twenty and fourteen. Then went twenty four and seven, and the tournament was canceled due to COVID. Yep. Then went thirteen and seven. I don't understand that. That was the COVID year. That that's right, and then was let go after being suspended. Yeah. So there's not. This is a guy that I don't think Vanderbilt would have the opportunity to get if it weren't for the situation, the unfortunate situation that unfolded at Louisville, where he got kind of caught up in the crossfire. I agree. He would be at a he would be at a college basketball blue blood right now. You know what? If it, if it wasn't for that unfortunate situation that happened to him, he would be at a blue blood right now. Um, and I, I think the really enticing thing about Chris Mack is, hey, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. All reports indicate Chris Mack wants, is very interested in this job. His daughter is attending Vanderbilt. He wants to get back into the coaching rink. Uh, I think this will be a great opportunity. If he wants the job, stop the search right now and just give him the job. Yeah, unless I can see why Vanderbilt would be a little hesitant. Maybe unless you kind have like, of unless like somebody like Shaka, which that shout out to uh, some homies in the group chat have floated that out. <laughs> unless like it, it, which he's I don't think he's interested. In but unless someone like Shaka Smart's interested, even then I would be like, hey, maybe still interview Chris Mack. But right now, and I'm and I'm saying this as somebody who loves the coaches' names that loves these names that have been floated, and even despite that, just give the guy the job. I, I heard somebody, Robbie Weinstein, hosted a Spaces on Twitter. And somebody made the comment that Chris Mack was the safe choice. That's just not true. That didn't make any sense. Chris Mack is not the safe choice. Chris Mack is the best choice with a super high ceiling and probably a low floor. I agree. I don't think Chris I Mack agree. is the safe choice. I think he's the best choice. I think he's the right choice, yep. I think if you could make Anyone on this list that I read off at the beginning, the safe choice, I think that's Kyle Smith from Washington State. I think it's a good choice. I think it's the safe choice. I think the ceiling is lower for him, mm -hmm. but he turned around a Washington State program and brought them to the NCAA tournament. Yeah. He is the safe choice. He's not the fire and brimstone guy, yeah. but he knows how to turn around a program that doesn't have the best NIL situation, which Vanderbilt has a way better NIL situation. That's a great point. Is recruiting said. against other more powerful programs with more tradition. He was still able to be successful. Mm -hmm. So all that glazing of Chris Mack, there are still great names on this list if they end up not hiring Chris yeah, Mack. Yeah, there are a couple names on this list. There's two that I would be I would be disappointed with yeah. i'll just be up front I'll, there's two names on this list i would be disappointed with everybody else i say hey that's a great hire chris mack is a slam dunk grand slam hire that will I make think. that will make a massive amount of national media attention if chris mack if they hire chris mack and the reports are true that vanderbilt is arming the basketball program with an nil war chest i'll say this right now on march 19th 2024 this team next season is going to the tournament. It's a big statement. I you get Chris Mack, and if the NIL stuff is true, this is gonna he's going to take them to the tournament year one. I think Chris Mack will be able to make a tournament in this first couple years. I don't think it's going to be year one. The roster is going to be very bare bone. Going to have to get his footing underneath them, get back into the swing of college recruiting a little bit. So. I'll give a year or a couple years of leeway there. Well, but also, I like that statement. Also, too, Chris Mack, good recruiter. Chris Mack with NIL money type recruiter. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a scary combination, I think. It is. Kyle Smith is a great name. Wire well, yeah, fireworks. fireworks. I've never seen that one before. If you're watching on YouTube. I don't. How did that happen? It's a cool animation. But Kyle Smith started <laughs> at Columbia, had some good runs at Columbia. Never made an NCAA tournament, but went to the college invitational tournament, whatever the hell that is. 
then went to San Francisco. I've never even heard of that. Had what? some really good, really good seat. The CIT champion. Am I tripping? Is that an Ivy League thing? Because that's Columbia. I could be. I don't know. But the San Francisco Dons, where he went on to coach for three years, went to the college basketball invitational, never made an NIT, never made an NCAA tournament, then went to Washington State in the Pac-12, not a good program, started out 16 and 16, slowly built up that program. Now in year five, they went 24 and nine, finishing second in the last season of the Pac-12 and are now in the NCAA tournament. So Kyle Smith has basically proven Mm -hmm. he can take a bottom of the barrel program give him five seasons, there'll be an NCAA tournament yeah. team. So I think he might be the safest choice. I don't think he's a guy that's going to take Vanderbilt to sweet 16s and elite eights mm-hmm. and be a big home run hire of of national media attention. But Kyle Smith is the safe choice, yeah. in my opinion, assuming he wants the job, which Vanderbilt is a way better situation than Washington State with resources yeah. that Washington State just does not have. They got absolutely ravaged in the transfer portal due to lack of NIL. So Kyle Smith is another name to keep an eye on, uh, but they're currently playing. So if he is the guy, if there's a delay in this announcement of more than a week or two, it might be more Kyle than a week, Smith. it's probably going to be one of these coaches that's currently coaching. Another guy we want to get to that's been recently brought up, Jerome Tang at Kansas State. I don't understand Jerome Tang as much. He's one of the guys. So on this list, I said there's two dudes on here that I would be really disappointed with. Now we have balloons. balloons. Um, Jerome Tang is one of those guys. Um, Why he's being floated, I don't really know. Um, but if he was the guy, I would be super, super disappointed. That might be the only guy on this list that is, that is not ready. He, he's not the guy. There's no track. He's only been a head coach for two years, mm-hmm. ever. He was an assistant coach at Baylor from 2003 to 2022. The associate head coach from 2017 to 2022. Perennial assistant. Went to Kansas State. Brought them to an elite eight in his first season as the head coach. Hell of a job. Yeah, great Utilize, job. Utilizing yeah. a talented roster from Kansas State. Bringing them there. But then this past season, he made, he went to the NIT. And you've never actually seen him recruit consistently power five level talent. Mm-hmm. So that's a guy that I just don't understand. His overall head coaching records 45 and 24. I'm not saying it would be a bad hire. He could be successful. Just compared to some of these guys on the list with proven success, he's not even close, in my opinion. He's a flash-in-the-pan guy currently that needs more consistent winning. Unless this Vanderbilt job is less desirable than me and you both think it is. Uh, any other opinions on Jerome Tang as you scroll through your watch? I'm trying to find the final score of the Vandy boys game. Um, with that being, I would be very disappointed with Jerome Tang. I'll be very, very disappointed. And then move on to Nico Medved, who's actually coaching right now in the play-in game, currently beating uh, Virginia 35-16. to Vandy boys win 3-1. They may never lose again. We may never lose again. May- moving the team to 18-3 and on the year. But Nico Medved's kind of a recent name, I think, discussed. He interests me. He does have experience the head coach at Furman from 2013 to 2017 head coach at Drake 2017 to 2018 and currently the head coach at Colorado State basically a good amount of success everywhere at at programs that aren't traditionally that successful brought Furman in his first year Furman went 9 and 21 in his final year at Furman they went 23 and 11 Mm -hmm. and each year was just progressively better went to Drake went 17 and 17 and then moved to Colorado State brought that program from going 12 and 20 to making an NCAA tournament at 25 and six, just three years later, making the NCAA tournament. And then this year, as an at large in the play, in a play in game of the NCAA tournament, currently whipping Virginia's ass. Yeah, Tony Bennett might get fired. Yeah, 37 to 16 over Virginia as of right now. That's a name that interests me. One I haven't seen floated until recently. So that's another guy, if you don't hear an announcement, yeah. could be the reason why. Also, a little off topic, Virginia making the tournament's crazy to me. That is crazy. Let alone being a 10 seed, that's insane. This is the same reason. It's the same reason Vanderbilt's in the play-in game. Virginia should not be in there. They're only in there because they're Virginia. Texas, I don't think Texas A&M should be in the tournament either. We're talking about women's basketball now. but Oh, sorry. No, that's what I mean. Is is the same thing we were talking about earlier where the NCAA 
the, clearly the net ranking has implications of previous seasons. Oh, no, I meant Texas A&M in the men's. Oh, yeah. Same, same, same idea. thing. Sorry, but it's obvious that the net ranking has bias towards previous season success, where you start out in the net. I think and that's right. the only reason Virginia should be in the tournament. This team is not good. No, if you watched Virginia, they're just not good. No. this year they're they're a team that's been a one seed in the past, and they're just not good. They lost seven of their. Uh... Uh, they went seven and eight in their past uh, 15 games. And now it's playing out exactly how everybody complaining thought it would play out, which yep. is a mediocre power conference team getting absolutely raked by a team that's not from the power five level. Yep. So Colorado State, then we move on to Bucky McMillan. Have not heard his name brought up recently, but he was kind of a hot candidate early before Jerry Stackhouse was even fired he's got a lot of juice man a lot of juice down at Samford I mean he's a 12 seed this year unless I'm mistaken I believe so playing in, no they're not playing Gonzaga I think they that's are playing Gonzaga that's, I think that's, that's McNeese. McNeese yeah they're maybe they're a 13 I don't know I'm trying to think who do they they don't play Alabama no but Bucky McMillan regardless we'll look that up in a second Bucky McMillan I mean, SoCon Coach of the Year three times mm -hmm. since he's been there. By the way, this is only his fourth season. So, Young. pretty, yeah, pretty solid. His first season was cut short by COVID, then went 21 and 11, 21 and 11, and then 29 and 5 at Samford. Young guy was a high school head coach from 2000, or a high school coach from 2006 to 2020, was a high school head coach at Mountain Brook High School from 2008 to 2020, got the job at San, Samford and then immediately he's had success. So that's kind of a high-risk, high-reward guy. It feels a lot – it's not the same, but it feels a lot like a Bryce Drew type hire to me. Not the same guy, obviously. Yeah. But I think if Vanderbilt didn't have what happened with Bryce Drew, I think that name would have intrigued me a lot more in the same way I saw a lot of fans talking about I really like that comparison to Bryce Drew. I haven't thought about that. I really like that comparison. So – Bucky's not at the top of my list. I haven't heard his name talked about that much recently. He would get me excited because I think he's a really hot, young, up-and-coming coach, and I think he's got some real juice to him. My reservation is he's so young. So young, and I think, like, and this is why I'm big on Chris Mack, and this I said it, that, that's just not what Vanderbilt needs right now. The program is not in the spot for that type of coach. You need somebody that's been in the trenches. But if they were to hire Bucky, I I would I'd be hyper excited, but I'd also be hyper nervous because I'm like this can either go better than I ever imagined or this could get very really high, bad. very very high ceiling. Yeah, very 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 low floor. Yep, to Bucky never has recruited at the level that you have to at Vanderbilt and it's never had to coach against the quality of coach that yep. you have in the SEC. You're exactly right. Which is where I, I think Bryce Drew was good at recruiting at that level. I think he had issues managing the personalities of the talent that he had. Mm -hmm. And I think he had issues against superior head coaches. Yeah. More experienced head coaches. So that's where I could see things going wrong with Bucky. Pat Kelsey, another name on this list, a guy I think you're very high on. I like Pat and Kelsey. Pat Kelsey. A lot. Pat Kelsey for a very similar reason, a lot more experienced uh, than Bucky coaching at the college level, started at the high school level, was an assistant at Wake Forest, was the associate head coach at Xavier. Mm -hmm. Another connection on this from 2009 to 2011, like that Xavier coaching tree. Coached at Winthrop for nine years and then has been coaching at Charleston, having incredible success <laughs> Yeah, at Charleston. Been to a lot of NCAA tournaments. I don't believe has ever won an NCAA tournament game. I don't believe so either. Uh, I could be wrong. Though. If my only concern with Kelsey, he's going to recruit shooters. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the guys that he is, that Kelsey has recruited at Charleston, I truly don't think that type of player can play in the SEC. It's a lot of very under recruited, under athletic shooters. Mm -hmm. It is kind of how he's built that Charleston program. So a lot of, a lot of Evan Taylor's. Yeah. It, which isn't, a problem Vanderbilt fans would love to see shooting, but at Charleston, I don't know if Kelsey's 
he's obviously not as proven. Like, I like Kelsey. I'd be excited about that hiring. It's just Chris Mack's resume is so much better. Absolutely. And I'll say this. They're not even comparable. I absolutely agree. I will say Pat Kelsey is my number two. I would go Mack. Personally, for me, I think Kelsey's my number two. We'll we'll go through and rank these. Yeah. The oh, okay. End. Good idea. Uh, yeah. Let's do that at the end. A uh, couple, a few more names here. Uh, three more names. We'll run through unless you have any you want to add. Another name I've seen floated out. I don't know how much juice this one has. Amir Abdurrahim. I would. He's, he's the second one that I would not want. Yeah. I would be very disappointed if we got Amir and Jerome. Yeah. This is or, an, This is another name that just hasn't had any proven success to me. Uh, when I look at the resume, it's just not comparable to some of the other names on this list. Was the head coach at Kennesaw State had three? Hor- obviously, okay. I want to preface this. I Kennesaw State is historically a horrible program, horrible in the Atlantic Sun. The only reason I know that fully is because Belmont used to be in the Atlantic Sun. My dad grew up, or I grew up a Belmont fan as well. Uh, my dad attended Belmont and is a huge fan. Kennesaw State is historically awful, okay? And the fact that he came in there and turned that program around to winning the A-Sun and going to the NCAA tournament in his fourth season is incredible. But he only had one winning season at Kennesaw State. And then he's gone to UCF, done an incredible job, but made the NIT. Just compared to some of the other names, I think this is a guy that if he keeps doing what he's doing at South Florida for two or three, like two more years, is a guy I'd be like, hell yeah. I agree. Let's bring him I on. agree. It's just not enough time. His over, not right now. His overall head coaching record, it's the same exact reason for Jerome Tang. He has a losing overall record as a head coach. He's 69 and 81. I just don't think you can take a risk on a guy based on potential with Vanderbilt basketball in the state it is in. I totally you, agree. I like how that I, I don't think I've said it like that before. You can't base this higher on potential of no. what they could be. Even if it's a little more boring, this has to be a guy that you're basing it on. He can do the job. Yes. You know you're not going to get a bust of a head coach. I've got one in right now. So that's another guy on this list. Let's keep going down. Josh Schertz, a name that's kind of fallen off recently. Yeah. Indiana State's head coach. I had meh listed next to him, but according to some the rumor mill, uh, he's in talks with St. Louis about their head coaching position. Also, I watched Indiana State. They're fun to watch. I don't think any of their players translate to the SEC level mm-hmm. of being a player. He's recruited a completely different level of talent at Indiana State than mm-hmm. what he's going to have to recruit at Vanderbilt. So Josh Schertz, I don't think that's going to happen. I think he's going to take the St. Louis job. I think that's more the level that he needs to jump to, has some success, and then moves up to a job at the level of Vanderbilt or another uh, power level program. And then the final name on this list is Trevor's watching the game for some reason. That's a 42 to 21 blowout. Uh, I love ball. (laughs) The final name here is a guy that's probably unrealistic, but it's Dusty May from FAU. I mean, talk about a statement higher. Yeah, that's not a guy Vanderbilt's going to get. But I had to bring him up. Yeah, because he's been, it, his name's gotten a lot of juice. Um, I don't think that's a home run, that's, by the way. That's, uh, <laughs> that's that type of hire. I think a Dusty May and a Chris Matt gets you national media coverage. I got to look up his resume, actually, a little bit more. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is his first head coaching position is at FAU, but the success that he has had is undeniable. Mm-hmm. He got FAU and at large bit last season. That just doesn't no doesn't happen. Got another one this year. That doesn't happen at FAU. Great basketball coach. So he's not as proven, but and he's probably going to be a guy that that takes a bigger level job. I think he's waiting on the Indiana job. If I had to yeah. guess, that's his alma mater. I think if Vanderbilt, even if Vanderbilt hired him, once that Indiana job comes open, he's out of there. He's out. So yeah. I, I think Dusty May's unrealistic because of that. But also, it's not a guy you want to pursue because I think his sights are set. And this is all screams real. James Franklin for basketball. Yes, yes. screams James Franklin. That's a great example. As, as a, a young guy that hey, I'm waiting to show my real potential at a Power Five, a Power Six for basketball program and i'm waiting for my penn state to open up exactly so overall coaching record of 126 and 68 for dusty may 
that's the kind of coaching record that I'm talking about. That's a little bit different. And he's young too. How old is he? Uh, 47. Yeah, he's not young. that young. Well, for ba- for a basketball coach, that's but which Bucky's I guess they 40. are getting younger and younger. Yeah, Bucky's yeah. 40. So that's what we're talking. He just Bucky McMillan just needs like five more years of yeah. experience. Chris Mack, 50. He's the perfect age to be yeah. brought into Vanderbilt right now. He's learned from his mistakes, calmed down a bit from his days at Xavier, his early days at Louisville. But don't you kind of want that fire, though? He's like, still going to have that fire, but he's learned from the mistakes. And, you know, yeah. dealing in the gray area has consequences. That is true. So that's why you're bringing him, bring him in for an interview. That's the exact reason. Figure out if he is slightly changed and adjusted and if he's going to fit in. Let's also not forget Kevin Stallings was no choir boy. That you, he's here for you, 16, you 17 that years. last night, and that's a great point. He got into an altercation with Joachim Noah, a yep. Florida basketball player. He told Wade Baldwin, in quote, I will fucking kill you. <laughs> so let's cut this narrative that Vanderbilt won't bring in a head coach with some fire. Yeah. Okay. That can happen and should happen. Trevor, do you want to make like a top three list to close it out here? Yep, I've got my top three already. This has not been a 30-minute episode, by the way. No. You mentioned we, we're like an hour 15. Yeah, we are. Do we both have number one the same? Yep, Chris Mack. My number two, I said it already. My number two is Pat Kelsey. Yeah, Chris Mack for me, number one, as I had to burp there, so Trevor jumped in. Chris Mack <laughs> is number one, and it's really not close it's it's me. chris mack big gap pat kelsey there there's a chasm between the two i would say my number two as boring as it may sound this is really gonna this is screwing me up now i'm gonna go with kyle smith as my number two to be honest because not because it's exciting not because i would be over the moon with the hire i just think kyle smith and i haven't watched a ton of washington state basketball so don't hold me to this completely. This is a huge chasm between Chris Mack. Mm-hmm. But Kyle Smith has done it. Yeah. You have seen him turn a Washington State program around with limited resources, no national recognition, way less national recognition than Vanderbilt, mm-hmm. recruiting in a bad area for basketball. Yeah, That's the guy that can come in, and you know you're not going to have a shit product. And- you're going to have a good product on the court. Is it going to be a team or a type of product that goes to Sweet 16s or elevates Vanderbilt basketball back to the days of packed houses and being top 15 in the country? I don't know. Mm -hmm. High floor, low ceiling. I agree. Which at this point, I never thought I'd, I would love to have a high floor, low ceiling guy. Yep. I'm right there with you. And a thing that interests me, and you briefly touched on it. At Washington State, goes up against really, really good basketball program. I mean, UCLA is a blue blood up there with Kentucky. You, he goes up against UCLA. Oregon has been a really good basketball team for the past couple of seasons. You got Arizona. USC has had a couple really good seasons. Um, he's gone up against some real talent. Uh, I like I like Pat Kelsey a lot. For my number three, I have a tie. Okay. So I'm going to go Kyle Smith and Nico Medva. Mm. Those are those are my threes. Um, I would be very, and I'll say this too: Chris Mack is my is my absolute number one. I would be very satisfied with number two and number three A and number three B. I would be very excited with those guys. But I would be lying if I said there wouldn't be a teeny bit of disappointment because Chris Mack is right there. I mean, he's right there, guys. You just do it. I, I almost put this as like a three-way tie at my number three spot, but I'll just keep it to a two-way tie because I think these guys are very – they're not the same coach. They're obviously different. They run different styles of a basketball program. But in relation to not having proven success, even though they're young guys, I'm going to put a tie at my number three with Bucky McMillan and Pat Kelsey. I like that. Bucky's not coming. So, like, I, I yeah. don't see that happening. So, I almost wanted to not include him in that list. But Bucky McMillan and Pat Kelsey probably tied at number three. And then Nico Medved probably very, very close behind mm-hmm. as either slash another person tied at third or number four. But he might bump up depending on how Colorado State does. Yeah, they look great right now. I'm going to be honest. I have not watched much Colorado State basketball. Uh, this is pretty impressive what they're doing yeah. under the bright lights of the NCAA tournament. So repeat your list there, Trevor, for everybody so they can hear it. Chris Mack, number one, big gap. Uh, Pat Kelsey, number two. 
number three, we have 3A and 3B. We have uh, 3A being Kyle Smith, 3B being Nico Medved. And then mine's Chris Mack, just like you. Huge gap. Kyle Smith, number two, and then a three-way tie at number three. We'll just say it that way. Pat Kelsey, Bucky McMillan, Nico Medved. So before we end this, if we could just do a quick thought experiment, just there's no way this coach would get hired. But if in like a pipe dream, is there one guy that you're like, I would give anything? Even if it's unrealistic, I would give anything for them to be the better basketball head coach. I don't really understand the question fully i mean like like is there like is there a guy that if you if this was an ai experiment and you were the one controlling the video controller and you had full control to make whoever in the world vanderbilt's basketball head coach who would it be who would yours be i know he hates nil i don't care mine would be jay wright i'd bring him out of retirement jay wright i would say mark few if I had to from Gonzaga, that would probably be up there. Yeah. For me. If I could very similar kind of restrictions within the yeah. program, academic constraints. I'm going to be honest of realistic candidates. Chris Mack is as gold plated as you can possibly. It, it feels too obvious. It feels. Yes. That's I, I feel like I'm going to come off as an idiot mm-hmm. at some point because I'm missing something mm-hmm. as to why he's not just the guy. Yep. He was railroaded at Louisville, Mm -hmm. is a guy that Vanderbilt probably could not get two years ago or couldn't get at the peak of the program with his resume towards the or when he right after Xavier. It's obvious Mm -hmm. to me. So I I feel like a lot of this discussion, I'm not going to be disappointed in pretty much any of those names outside of the ones we pointed out if it was to be the guy. But Chris Mack to me is as far as realistic candidates, the guy. I totally agree. That's about it. Anything else you want to add on episode 264? Things are finally looking up for Vanderbilt basketball, baby. Maybe. Maybe so. Well, that's about it for episode 264. For myself, Will Byram, and my co-host, Trevor Hewlin, this has been episode 264 of The Door Report, powered by 615 Collectibles.